Good morning, uh, Village Church. It's good to be back with you uh, this Sunday, and um, we welcome those who are joining us online this morning as well. And uh, we're still in our series, um, uh, Running on Empty. I almost forgot the title of my own series. It's Running on Empty. And uh, after this morning, we just have one more message left in this series. And uh, Rev. Kev and Nona texted me this morning. They're looking forward to getting back here in about a week or two. And um, so we look forward to them getting back and just continue to pray for them as they have some time away. And God uh, refuels them and refills them like we're talking about here during this series. And that's what we've been talking about. It's often a forgotten and ignored part of our faith. But the spiritual disciplines, or what we're calling here the Jesus habits, right, are so very important to the spiritual vitality and the work that God wants to do in us each day. And I'd like to kind of recap just a little bit here what we've learned so far. So if you've been here for the last several weeks, the first thing that we talked about was hurry. So has anybody slowed down this past week or two? All right, so we have, yeah, we have a few here that slowed down a little bit. So many times we're in such a hurry that we don't have the time that we really need, that God really desires for us to spend with him. And, And we don't really find that rest for our souls that all of us need. And the second thing that we talked about, if you were here just last week, we talked about Sabbath. And we have it up here on the screen, and it means to stop or cease. And we learned that God intentionally designed us to work six days a week, but he also designed us to take one day off with no work and completely devoted to him and walking with him and spending time with him and enjoying those things that we delight in and those things that bring rest for our soul. I remember this past Sunday after my message, me and Noel were talking about what we were learning. We were talking about things like, uh, you know, what would our Sabbath look like? What would we do on our Sabbath? And we decided that Sunday to rest for the rest of the rest of the Sabbath day. And I said, great. I said, what's for lunch? And Noel said, figure it out. I'm taking my Sabbath today, right? (laughs) So uh, like you, I need to better prepare for my Sabbath, specifically when it comes to my lunch um, in the future. So I, I hope that you're doing that, though. I hope that you're, we, even if you start out with six hours or maybe 12 hours, that you're taking time off um, from work and allowing God to refill your souls. So we're going to move on to our next Jesus habit. But before we do, um, I want us to take another look at Matthew 11, verses 28 through 30. And I know a lot of you is like, we've been reading this passage every Sunday for the last two weeks. But this is what a, deal, this, a spiritual discipline in. It is repetition. I really want these passages to sink in um, as we're going through this together. And we've read it from the message version. We've read it from the NIV. And, and this morning, we're going to read it from the amplified version. So we have it up here on screen. And let me read it to us this morning. It says, Come to me, all who are weary and heavenly burdened by religious rituals that provide no peace. And I will give you rest, refreshing for your souls with salvation. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Follow me as my disciple, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest, renewal, blessed quiet for your souls. For my yoke is easy to bear, and my burden is light. I want us to take note of verse uh, 29. We're going to put that up here on the screen. Last week we focused on verse 28 and how it connected with the Sabbath. And we're going to look at it, uh, verse 20, focus on verse 29 this morning. And I'm going to read it to you again here. Uh, Take my yoke up on you and what? Learn from me. Follow me as my disciple. For I am gentle and humble in heart and you will find rest, renewal, blessed quiet for your souls. I mean, notice what Jesus says. He says, take my yoke, which means to take up on you his ways and his strength in your life. And we touched on this last week, and we we understand that this is an analogy that Jesus used of being uh, two oxen that were harnessed or yoked together. And spiritually, it's the same for us with Jesus. Amen? I mean, we are, as children of God, we are harnessed, and we are yoked to Jesus, and he carries the lion's share of the weight for us. However... Many times, God still gives us just enough weight, doesn't he? 
He, he doesn't take all of the weight or all the pressure away, but he gives us just enough so that we can handle it, so that we can maneuver through life. I, I'm reminded with my uh, boys when they first started to learn how to mow the grass. Anybody remember that, teaching your kids how to mow the grass? And they could barely see over the handles you know, of the lawnmower. And I can remember saying, push, you know, because, of course, that's why I had brought you into this world, to mow my grass, right? And I was like, push this lawnmower. And they begin to push, and they would begin to slip and slide because of all the weight that they was trying to push. And I was behind them, though, and I can remember, I would, you know, I would just nudge the lawnmower a little bit. And they'd begin to push a little bit harder, and, and they, before you know it, they were pushing the lawnmower. And when we came to deep grass, you know, I'd push a little bit harder. Or when we went down a hill, I'd kind of pull back a little bit. Or when we went back up a steep hill, I'd push a little bit harder until the yard was completely mowed. You see, this is exactly what Jesus wants to do with us. He wants to teach us and he wants to prepare us for the ups and downs of life. And one thing that my kids didn't notice is that I was really doing most of the pushing. They thought they were pushing the lawnmower. You know, but it's the same thing with our faith. Jesus is pushing and he's pulling for us. He's keeping us on track. And we would have no idea, uh, we, we couldn't even imagine if he were to completely let off of all the weight that he's carrying for us. So to learn from Jesus, we must do what? We must listen. And those of us who have children, we understand this, right? <laughs> Especially those of us who have teenagers. I mean, how often have you said these words? Would you just listen to me, right? Would you just hear what I have to say? I, I have so much to tell you, and life would be so much easier if you would just listen to me. So as grown adults, why do we struggle so much listening to our Heavenly Father? I mean, in many ways, we're just as guilty as our children and our teenagers because we don't stop and listen when God wants to speak to us. We struggle hearing that small, still voice and learning from the Master. So this morning, one of the Jesus habits that we're actually two, we're going to, we're going to learn about is to listen, and we're going to talk about silence and solitude. Uh, Mother Teresa, so I think we're in pretty good company here, she said this about spending time with God each day. It's up here on the screen. If you spend one hour a day not doing anything wrong, I know that's hard for most of us here this morning, in adoring your Lord, you will be fine. So Mother Teresa is telling us if we would just spend one hour a day, there are 168 hours a week, if we would just take seven of those hours and spend some quiet time with God, he would refresh and refuel our souls. That's all we need to live in the will of God. Another spiritual giant, Henry Nguyen, uh, stated this. He, this is pretty blunt. This is what he said. We do not take the spiritual life seriously if we do not set aside some time to be with God and to listen to him. Now, I know these are easier said than done, right? But before you write me off and before we go back to our busy and hurried life, just listen to what these experts have to say. Mother Teresa and Henry, and, uh, Henry Nguyen and, and, and Jesus, and just stop and think of what's at stake. Because our quiet time with God is what refuels our soul each day. I got a chart here up on the screen, and we see an empty tank and, and a, a full tank. And we see here that if we have an empty tank, we feel distant from God, right? I mean, we feel a million miles away from God. If we have a full tank, we feel close and we feel intimate with God. If we have an empty tank, we feel distant from ourselves. If we have a full tank, we're in touch with our soul, with our body, with our soul, with our mind. Anxiety and depression are common if we have an empty tank in, in the, versus a calm life and a life of hope. Addictions. We tend to run towards our addictions when we have an empty tank to, to numb the difficult things in our life. But when we have a full tank, we start to feel alive again. We start to feel God's presence in our life and his purpose for us. We have it easily, we're more easily attempted on, with an empty tank. Whereas we're living close to God and we have that full tank, we're, we're living a life pleasing to God and we're living holy lives. And lastly, we're always in a rush trying to get to the next thing before we run out of gas, trying to do this or that. 
But if we're close with God, we have a full tank, we can breathe again and just breathe in the presence of God in our life. So this morning, where do you fall in this chart? Because if you're on the right side, keep doing whatever you're doing. But if you're on the left side, maybe it's time to begin listening more and allowing God to refuel your soul each day. So before we take a, a closer look at silence and solitude this morning, I want to address one of the biggest distractions. We, and we have distractions all the time, right? I mean, God, the, the enemy is always using something to distract us from taking this time that he, God wants to have with us and interfering with our uh, time with God. And I think probably the biggest distraction, we all have them, right? It's in our living room. It's maybe in our office. It's in our home. It's probably either in your pocket or your purse this morning. And it's called technology. Now, to be clear, I'm not Mr. Super Rigid up here this morning. I'm not telling you to throw away your cell phones or your computers or your television sets. But since the dawn of the digital age, say about 23 years ago, uh, they, technology has helped, right? I mean, we are more efficient than we've ever been. We are, to, we are able to communicate in ways we've never been able to communicate before. And we can get more done in a shorter amount of time. I, can, I remember talking to a, a colleague of mine from many, many years ago. He said, you remember when we first started out in ministry, we used to handwrite our messages out or type them on those typewriters? I'm just like, wow, you know, I can't believe we used to do that. So there's nothing wrong with technology. However, though, if we're honest with ourselves, it has become a distraction in our lives. And for some of us, maybe it's even become an addiction that it interferes with our time with God. I want to share a few studies with you this morning. In the recent study, it found, and listen to this, it found that the average American cell phone user touches their phone at least, get this, I mean, this at least shocked me, maybe it won't shock you, not a thousand times, not 1,500 times, not 2,000 times or 2,500 times, but the average cell phone user will touch their phone at least 2,617 times a day. And it's even double that for millennials as well. I mean, they're pushing to 5,000 times day of range that they're touching their cell phones. And furthermore, the study goes on. It says the average American will be staring at a screen for at least six hours and 58 minutes a day. So not only is technology affecting our time with God, but our attention span as well. Another study says this. It says that before the digital revolution in 2000, our attention span was 12 seconds. <laughs> I mean, not a whole lot to brag about, right? But not surprisingly, it has dropped to 8 seconds. And to put this into perspective, okay, a goldfish, you know what the attention span of a goldfish is? 9 seconds. So, brothers and sisters, we are losing to goldfish, right? So all of these devices, I mean, they're screaming at us all day long. They're screaming for our attention, and we're turning to them 24 hours a day, another ringtone or another email or text message or another social media app, and just a, just a few minutes away. And this distraction, if, if we stop and really think about it, is robbing us of the most important thing that we can do in our relationship with God. And that is to be present in the moment with Him. And that is God's desire for all of us here this morning, that when God speaks to us, that we are present to Him. And not only that, that we are present to one another. Your children need you to be present in their life. Your spouse needs to hear you, and you need to hear your spouse and be present in their life. And we need to be present to our own souls, that we're taking care of ourselves, that we're, we're recognizing that there are things in our lives that we need to change. It could, be, it could be a physical thing. It could be a mental thing. I don't know. It could be a health. It could be a diet, whatever it is. But we need to be present with ourselves as well. John Mark Comer said it this way, the noise of the modern world makes us deaf to the voice of God, drowning out the one input we need most. So how do we do this? How do we set aside our distractions, find some quiet time with God long enough to hear His voice and to feel His presence in our life? Well, I think the first one is that we can be intentional to spend time with Jesus. Be very intentional about that, because many times when it comes to planning our time with Jesus, we just kind of get up in the morning, right? Kind of like, okay, I, I, I know I need to spend some time with you, Jesus. It's been a little while, and we we just kind of put ourselves on autopilot. We cross our fingers, 
and we hope that our busy schedule will allow some time for us to spend time with God, right? Which is usually a miss or hit approach. And if we're honest, it's usually miss, right? It tells us in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 15 through 17, really let these words soak in. So be careful how you live. Don't live like fools, but like those who are wise. Make the most of every opportunity in these evil days. Don't act thoughtlessly, but understand what the Lord wants you to do. Let me ask you a question this morning. If we're not paying attention to God, how in the world are we supposed to know what Jesus wants us to do? So like anything else in your life, make an appointment with Jesus. I mean, we schedule appointments all the time, right? Uh, to, to go to work, you know, we, we, to a doctor's appointment, maybe a night at the movies, a golf game, picking up the kids. I mean, we make appointments all the time. So I would challenge you this morning to pencil in, just start wherever you think you're at. Maybe it's 10 minutes, maybe it's 20 or 30 minutes a day, whatever for, works for you, and schedule an appointment with Jesus and treat it with the same commitment as you would any other appointment that you make. And I promise you, over time, just like you get into the rhythm of going to work or picking up your kids or doing X, Y, or Z, spending time with Jesus will just become a natural thing, a natural rhythm in your life. So be intentional to make an appointment with Jesus. The second thing is to find a quiet place. Find a quiet place. And in the Matthew uh, chapter 3, we read about this launch pad, if you will, will, where Jesus was sent out to change the world. I mean, that wasn't no small task, right? He was, it was a launch pad of his ministry. And he was baptized by John the Baptist. And when Jesus was lifted out of the water, the Father literally says out loud in Matthew three seventeen, he says, and a voice from heaven said, this is my son who I love. With him I am well pleased. And here's the interesting thing. Notice what happens the very next verse in Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 2. Look what Jesus does. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him. I mean, I, I don't know about you, but I think that's interesting. I mean, the first thing that Jesus did after his baptism, that he went and found a quiet place. He didn't go get a photo op, right? He, he didn't uh, start writing out his to-do list or all the ministry plans that he certainly was probably thinking about. But he went to the desert. And the desert in the Greek is called Aramis, and it can be translated in several different ways. But the four, ways, the four main ways is this, desolate, solitary, wilderness, or my personal favorite, a quiet place. But why is that? I mean, of all places that you could go toe-to-toe with the devil, why would you go to a solitary place and go there alone? And I can remember for years when I first read this passage and I was reading through this story, I thought of the desert was a, a place of weakness. Uh, I mean, isn't in, in that just how the enemy works? I mean, after a long day, right? After a long week, or in Jesus' case, after 40 days, after we were hangry, <laughs> Right? And things are getting rough, and we're getting tired, and we feel weak. That is where the enemy tries to take us out. But over time, and I'm still learning this even today, I realize that the desert or the quiet place isn't a place of weakness, but it's a place of strength. It's where we go to get refueled. And in that moment, when the enemy came to Jesus, he was at the height of his spiritual power. And it was because he went to this quiet place to spend time in prayer and fasting. And he was able to defeat the devil and to walk away unscathed. And we see this over and over in the life of Jesus. Always finding a quiet place. Always saying, hey, I, I need some time away. I need to go and pray. Kind of like, leave me alone right now. I need to go to the Father so that he could refuel and refresh his soul. And if Jesus needs to do that, don't you think that we need to do that as well? I want to share with you another example that Jesus had a very long day from morning through the evening. And it's uh, Mark chapter 1, the verses 32 through 33. And it says this, That evening after the sunset, the people brought to Jesus all of the sick and demon-possessed. The whole town gathered at the door. 
And Jesus healed many who had various diseases. He also drove out many demons. So after a very long day, he started in the uh, morning um, all the way until after sunset. He was exhausted. He was teaching. He, he, he healed uh, Peter's mother-in-law. He was, uh, he was healing the sick, the, the demon-possessed. And the next day, what does Jesus do? Does he sleep in? Nope. Does he call the disciples and say, hey, let's have brunch and you can take the rest of the day off? <laughs> yeah. But this is what he does. Mark chapter 1, verse 35. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. So you see, quiet time for Jesus wasn't just an occasional thing. I mean, many times we take a retreat once a year and say, I spent my time with Jesus, right? I mean, he spent each day spending time in a quiet place, and he practiced this each day of his life. So a question for you this morning, where is your quiet place? Now, you may be like, if you're at my house, there is no quiet place, Mike. But uh, where could that be? Uh, it, could be your, it could be a room. It could be uh, your deck. It could be maybe going to a local park. Maybe it's your car at break time. But where do you go each day to refuel and prepare for the battles and the challenges ahead? And spouses, you're going to have to help each other with this. I mean, there's going to be times you're going to say, hey, honey, when's your quiet time? I'll protect you from the kids, right? <laughs> Give me your cell phone, and I'll let you know if there's anything important coming up. And you go, and you spend quiet time. And if you do that for one another, you will see your husband or your wife grow in Jesus in ways that you've never imagined. So work together on this in your family. So let's... Uh, begin to wrap things up here and, and touch on the Jesus habit of silence and solitude. And they're pretty straightforward, so I'm not going to spend a, a whole lot of time on these this morning. But there is a difference between solitude and silence, and both are important, but they are two different things. So I want to go to a book. It's by Ad, um, Adele Calhoun, and it's called The Spiritual Disciplines, Disciplines excuse me, Handbook. Now, I know that doesn't sound very exciting, <laughs> But it is a very good book. It just gives you some very practical ways um, to practice the spiritual disciplines. And she defines solitude this way. To leave people behind and enter a time alone with God. Just really that simple. So solitude is exactly that. It's spending uninterrupted time with God. Just time with you and Jesus. Maybe some praise music, listening to a sermon. Maybe you're journaling some thoughts. I mean, some of my most intimate moments were with God are during my times of solitude. Now, I want to clarify this morning that there's a difference between solitude and isolation. Because I know there may be some of us here this morning that struggle with that. Some of us are isolators, right? And it's not a healthy thing. Because the, the two words, solitude and, and um, isolation, are worlds apart. So if you're taking notes and you, you struggle with this, I want to write you to write these things down. Solitude is engagement with God, all right? Solitude is engagement with God. Isolation is escape from God and escape from others. Solitude is safety. Isolation is danger. And solitude is opening yourself up to God, and isolation is painting a target on your back for the tempter. So there's a huge difference between solitude and isolation. Richard Foster wrote it this way, he says, loneliness is inner emptiness. Solitude is inner fulfillment. So when you enter your time of solitude with the right moments, you are anything but alone, and God will feed you, and God will nourish your soul. So now silence. So and that's a little bit more challenging for most of us here, right? I'm just joking, right? I'm the guy on the stage doing the talking here. But this is how Calhoun uh, describes uh, silence says, to free myself from the addiction to and distraction of noise so I can be totally present to the Lord, to open myself to God in a place beyond words. So silence is removing all those distractions. Silence is a time of no noise, no speaking, no words, and to be completely attentive to what God is trying to specifically say to you. And again, how often do we do this? How often do we just stop the noise that we're so addicted to and just quiet our minds and our hearts and say, Lord, before I speak, I want to hear you speak. Lord, before I lead, I need you to lead me. 
Lord, before I make plans, I need you to show me the next step. And just be quiet and let God speak to your heart and to your mind. Uh, Job 6.24 says this, Teach me and I will be quiet. Show me where I have been wrong. Because here's the deal. God is not going to complete, uh, compete with all of the noise that you dial up in your life. So a time of uh, silence is exactly that. Complete silence, just listening to God. I mean, I love listening to praise music like anyone else, but there are times when maybe God has a different message for me than Chris Tomlin, all right? I mean, we just need to step back and let God speak to us and give, a, give Him our undivided attention. And maybe during your time of solitude, begin to practice silence. Just spend five or ten minutes in total silence and let God uh, speak to your heart and be still and quiet before the Lord. And I promise you, you will begin to hear his small, still voice. So we've cultivated some spiritual soil here. We've talked about being intentional. We've talked about silence and solitude. And I want to kind of begin to close things up here with listen. I love this passage from Isaiah 55, verses 2 through 3. And it says it three times. Listen closely to me, and you will eat what is good. Your soul will enjoy the rich food that satisfies. Come to me and listen. Listen to me so that you may live. I mean, once God has our attention, listening and hearing from God will become easier and easier, and you will eat what is good and your soul will be satisfied. This morning, I want to share a confession with you. I'm not always too good at this listening thing. <laughs> you know, you're sitting here listening to me and go, Mike, this is hard. I know it is. And I can remember some time ago, I went to a three-day seminar. It was with uh, pastors and with some church leaders. And just a footnote, don't go on a retreat with a bunch of pastors. Just, just don't do that. They're, we're a mess. No, I'm just joking. But one of the sessions we were uh, challenged to spend four hours in complete silence and solitude. And whether that was finding some place in the building or going to a local park or wherever you wanted to do this at, you turned in your cell phones, there was no text messages, no emails, just complete silence and solitude with God. And as you can imagine, those first 20, 30 minutes were very, very rough. And I can remember, I, I thought to myself, I, I need to do something, right? So I, I went to the park and my type A personality started to kick in. And I'm thinking to myself, all these things that I need to do, I can catch up on that. I can cheat a little bit and I can make a few phone calls or I can shoot out a few emails, whatever that may be. And my, my mind was going ever, everywhere. But in the midst of that silence, in the midst of that solitude, God spoke to my heart clearly. And he said, Mike, when was the last time? And maybe God is asking you this morning, when is the last time that you received my kindness? When was the last time that you came into my presence with no agenda, but simply to spend time with me? And I just want to remind you that this morning, brothers and sisters, that God just wants to be kind to you. He just wants you to sit in his presence and enjoy company with him. I mean, that is why he created us in the first place. He didn't create us to be doers. He created us to become closer to him and become more like him. And he wants to whisper in your ear. He wants to share those secrets and those things with you that you need to know to encourage you and to make you stronger. So let me close with this. I, I know a, a lot of what we've been talking about since we started this series may seem difficult. I mean, we've talked about slowing down, stop being in a, in a hurry all the time, stop our busyness. We talked about spending a full 24 hours of, of Sabbath with just delighting and resting in God. And now I'm telling you to spend one hour a day of quiet time with God. And I get it. Nobody else does this, right? I mean, I warned you before when I started this series that what I'm going to be talking about is going to be counterintuitive and countercultural. But I'm just asking you, and I'm, I'm asking myself too, <laughs> just hang in there. Because over time, with a little practice and a lot of help from the Holy Spirit, these Jesus habits, they will usher in a new way of life for you. A new freedom in your life and in your faith that you could never imagine. Because that's what God desires. And I hope that we're being reminded throughout this series, at least that, that we are being reminded that we have limitations. 
We all have limitations. We all have weaknesses in our life. There's only so much that we can do. And we're learning that our emotional and our physical and our mental and our spiritual reservoirs will eventually run out. And God says, I want you to have rest for your souls so that we're not always running on fumes or, or just keeping our heads above water. I mean, that's not how God wants us to live. So I want to share one more passage with you this morning. Psalms 131, well, I'm sorry, uh, Psalms 139, verses 13 through 15. It says, You made all the delicate inner parts of my body, and you knit me together in my mother's womb. Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. Your workmanship is marvelous, how well I know it. You've watched me as, as I was being formed in utter seclusion, as I was woven together in the dark of the womb. See, David recognized just how fragile he was. And today, with medical advancements and mental health and in, in science, we know even more today than David just how delicate and complex we are designed. God knitted us together. He gave you a personal personality. He gave you gifts. He gave you desires and passions. He gave us temperaments and the way that we think. He chose those areas of our life that would be strong to do the work for him, but also he chose those areas of our lives that we would be weak, that would keep us humble. And he put everything precisely in place, everything that makes you, you. But he also asked us to take care of it, to be good stewards of ourselves. Because just as God was with us in the womb for nine months, we still need him today even more. So let me ask you a question this morning. How are you doing? <laughs> and, I, and I don't say that lightly. I mean, how are you really doing? I mean, maybe you haven't heard this question from anyone in quite a while. And maybe this morning on the surface, you look strong and you look competent and you look uh, confident and you're a leader and you're a warrior for Jesus and Jesus needs us to be strong. So you make sure that everyone sees you as a strong person and you tuck all those wounds and all those hurts deep down. And nobody really notices. It's not because nobody cares, but it's because we wear our mask pretty well, don't we? We've become pretty good at faking a smile. We become pretty good at just saying all of the right things. However, on the inside, those delegated complex parts that God put together and that he knitted in the womb have become torn and twisted and infected with chaos and confusion and fatigue. So this morning, it's my prayer, and it's my deepest prayer, not just for you, but for myself, that we would give God permission each day that we can give God space in our lives to deal with those tough things, those tough questions that maybe you've been struggling with for days or weeks or maybe even years, and that we would just take that time and invite Jesus into those dark and secret places in our soul so that we can find rest for our souls and that God can shape us into the likeness of Christ. That is God wants, that's what God wants, you to, wants to do in your life this morning. It's not about doing, it's about who you are becoming. And Jesus is more concerned about where you are right now than what you did yesterday or what you have planned for tomorrow. And he just wants to have company with you. Amen? Let me pray for us this morning. Dear God, I'm amazed that you would want us for a friend. Help us to learn how to have conversations with you each day. Help us to spend time with you. Remove those obstacles. Remove those distractions in our life. Because you care about every detail of our lives. And Jesus, we will just want to know you more and more every day to depend on your guidance in our work, in our families, in our church, in every other area of our lives. So help us to hear your voice. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen.